Welcome to the Directions Mag Geo Inspirations podcast series with Joseph Kursky. Welcome everyone to another episode in the Geo Inspirations podcast series, the Geo Inspirations podcast series, where we chat with people making a difference in our world using spatial thinking and geotechnologies. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Harold Shook to our listeners. Harold, welcome. Thank you, Joseph, for having me. Oh, it is indeed a pleasure. I've known you for quite a few years and have long respected your work. Can you, Harold, explain your current role or roles and position in the geospatial and education communities? Currently, I am engaged in four activities in relation to GIS. The first one is a basic geomatics web course that is dedicated to beginners in the field. The second one is publishing books about the same topic. The third one is the insertion of basic geomatics concepts in the surveying course at the university to make civil engineering students aware of where official reference systems come from and why GIS is useful for their activities. Thanks, Harold. I know that you speak many different languages. And since the Geo Inspirations listeners are a very curious group of people, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was, okay, what what six languages do you speak? Well, I do speak German, first of all, because my parents came from Vienna, Austria, where we spoke German at home. Then I learned Spanish since I was born in Chile and lived there for 18 years. Then comes Italian. Uh, While my parents stayed in Italy for seven years, I was sent to a Swiss boarding school where I was for five years. And during that time, I learned French while attending that boarding school. Then comes English, which during my presence in Canada and the US was necessary to survive in business. And I did that over 50 years. And finally comes Portuguese because I've done extensive work in Brazil. So English is only my fifth language. Let me tell you, each one of these languages were learned in country, which means that their acquisition was not casual, like in the case of just taking a course. Since since each country has its own set of cultural characteristics issues, and emotional profiles. This can do a number on the learner, and all I can do sometimes is just wait and chill out. <laughs> Harold, this is, th- this is fascinating, and I'm hoping we can pick apart maybe how your international experiences as a, as a young person and as an adult influenced how you see geospatial technology and teaching and learning. So let's start with how did you enter the geotechnology field? Well, it all started in the 1960s when I attended that Swiss boarding school. Yes, indeed, I changed countries nine times and having picked up those six languages and collected four citizenships in the process. I was asked by my geography teacher in Switzerland to prepare a map of Europe He liked my product so much that he presented it to the class of 50 students as what everyone should have produced. Later, when he came to select a university program, that was the experience that guided me in the choice of college program to pursue. At that time, various universities had a program like that, and Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada had one called Geodetic Sciences. And then I can note that the Canadian citizenship was my third after the Austrian and the Chilean. Of course, now I am an American. These programs led to the development of about a dozen early GS products around the world by the industry. Once I graduated, I continued on to a program called 
photogrammetry and, and remote sensing, which was a master's program at the University of Washington, Washington, Seattle, which in turn led to a job in Loveland, Colorado, where in 1980, I was asked to develop a photogrammetric system. This was a desktop solution, one of the first such systems based on the Hewlett Packard 9825 computer. This is a small machine that had about the size of a typewriter, which was unheard of at that time. This attracted the attention of the government of Mexico, which asked me to develop a cadastral system that's uh, for land parcel recording based on the same desktop. After delivering 40 systems to various locales in that country, I got the Colorado Governor's Award in 1985. Uh, I love this journey, Harold. Um, I've been to Ryerson. I know a couple of faculty there that teach geospatial technology in retail and business. And the last trip I was on to Toronto, I actually visited the campus, was there for a whole day and absolutely loved it. Uh, kudos. Yeah. So they continue to carry the torch in many different areas, infiltrating, influencing geospatial technology in not just in one or two departments on campus, but in many departments on campus, which I know you and I love. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you today. So let's pick apart that a bit. Do you see a link between GIS and geodesy? Most definitely. Uh, what I like to say is that GIS technology is knowledge that was packaged into the software of advanced systems. Good operational training for that software assures the efficient operation. I feel that this important training needs to be accompanied by an introduction to some of the relevant mapping concepts. Since GIS databases are built using real world coordinate systems for which communities worldwide have spent so much money to acquire and GIS operators normally need to run applications within them. Indeed. Well, what kind of information do you bring to the table? All right, to, to give an example, uh, one key piece of information required is the datum of a coordinate system. So where are the horizontal, uh, horizontal and vertical zeros for these coordinates? What points on earth hold the origins for the whole reference system or for any portion thereof? These questions are relevant given that all large projects are now referenced to them. That means we have to think about documented this information and make sure that every database that uses coordinates requires two datum statements that other users can use, one for horizontal positions and one for elevations. GIS operators need to be able to generate such statements for their data clients to guarantee certain valuable information. Without that, I consider a GIS database to be at risk of being misused. You know, some of these things you're talking about, actually all of these things are so fundamental to geospatial technology. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you today. I've always respected your grounding, literally, in geodesy as a fundamental set of skills and perspectives for GI scientists. Certainly, we, you and I and others are not pining for the old days in GIS. It's an exciting time for GIS, but there are certain elements in the wonderful world of web-enabled SaaS-based tools and the ability to grab data and within a half a minute make a map and symbolize it and classify it. In that onslaught of easy use tools and data sets available from open GIS portals, there is a concern, right, that you and I have talked about in the past of students, professionals, and others not having this grounding in 
the shape and size of the earth and all the implications therein. So that all being said, what other you know, know-how did you encounter as, as missing out there in the field? As you indicate, when it comes to the grounding information, uh, too often this information is considered known or too basic to be taught. Unfortunately, that's where most of the errors, the early errors by operators are being committed. So beyond the topic of origins, which I mentioned previously, there are topics such as transformations that are used to insert data sets into GIS. They also require a minimum knowledge to perform them professionally. What do I mean by that? Many operators are not aware that transformation can, if transformations can in effect deform a data set. Let me repeat that, can deform a data set, especially if the affine alternative is used. Unfortunately, affine transformations are often preferred because they result in smaller control point residuals, giving the impression that the solution is better when in fact it is definitely not that actually something was damaged and something was deformed to achieve a better fit. In addition, I should say that transformations use math called least squares adjustment that achieves the best fit conditions between this data set to be imported and the existing GIS database. Since it is based on statistics, it is used to measure, first of all, and express, second of all, how well the inserted data set fits the existing GIS database. Now, this is something everyone would, would like to know. Thanks, Harold. A couple things come to mind. A, one of the still in the 2020s, most common, and this has been the case for years, question on blogs, listservs, chat boards, et cetera, and in standard emails and phone calls are about projections and transformations. So I think you're hitting on something that is, is still a concern. There's still a lack of knowledge. And so again, I, I appreciate your leadership in this. The second thing that comes to mind is I've got that spatial reserves data book and blog that I know you and I have chatted about in the past. It came out of an ESRI press book. My co-author and I, Jill Clark, we've maintained it for almost 10 years now. But one of the pieces that we recently put in there is be aware of and be critical of default settings in your GIS software. In other words, don't just click, 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 click and take all the defaults and don't understand what they're, what the defaults are. Sometimes the defaults are there. Oftentimes the, G, the defaults are there for good reason. It's the most common or the most common workflow or something like that. But I think, you know, what you and I are passionate about is having students, professionals, others really examine, are these default settings appropriate for the problem that you're trying to solve with the data that you have and the scale that you have and encourage them to understand what those settings are and know how to override the defaults if necessary. Right, Harold? <laughs> so right. I appreciate all your comments here. What other information, detail, et cetera, would you like to see taught that's maybe not taught as rigorously or as often right now? Over the past four decades, I have found myself explaining this material in many environments, including environments that had little information at hand. This has helped me polish the content of my messages and arrange this content into a natural sequence of concepts. This is key. For example, Newcomers to GIS might benefit from learning about bearings and azimuths and how the US Public Land Survey system tracks every land parcel out outline through townships and sections. Many of the large GIS solutions have this kind of frame framework in place. 
So all of this only makes sense if practical and theoretical material are combined meaningfully. To illustrate the need for specific training, I could mention a bit of basic trigon trigonometry. For, for example, it so happens that we in high school learn that at zero direction is to the right and 90 degrees point up on the paper. In mapping, however, zero can be up or down and 90 degrees is to the right or left, as in the case of directions that are called bearings in all land parcel maps found mm -hmm. on GIS databases. These bearings cause many errors in calculations since it switches sines and cosines in trig. So that has to be learned. That is not learned in high school. That is why I start my training with a quick, quick review of survey trigonometry. And that is the difference. I do not bring very complex topics to the table, but I bring those that have revealed themselves as important sources for error. Now, one of my principal efforts uh, to create a meaningful message was to respect dependencies between the various concepts. For example, a natural sequence would be given when teaching the following in the given order to provide a just-in-time hierarchy. First would come trigonometry to get angles and functions right. In other words, to know when sine and cosine are switched. Then comes basic matrix calculus to capture data and develop solution. This is not a semester matrix calculus course. This is a one session to teach you the basic ideas necessary to understand what happens in a GIS database. This is followed, followed by analytic geometry. Why? Because for every calculation, you need a mathematical model, and this is then used for the development of a simple equation or a set of equations. For example, in the case of, of transformations, you need analytic, analytic geometry and matrix calculus to formulate transformations and understand them. Can you teach them in two sessions? Yes, of course. Then comes least squares adjustment. This is a very important process based on statistics. This is to create best fit conditions, let's say between one data set and another, and to understand what kind of accuracy measurements are made available to the operator and understand them and document them and to transfer that as part of a delivery of a data set. And finally, transformations that use all of the above. So to teach this in any other sequence is not representative of a natural progression of interdependent concepts. This principle is a wide application, since, for example, GPS depends on all of that, and I mean global positioning system. These receivers measure the distances to many satellites and then calculate one point. But what are the steps? The steps are first to use trigonometry for mathematically model, modeling each 3D distance between your receiver and a single satellite. They use tables or matrices to capture data and calculate solutions. Then they use least squares adjustment to produce a single point from an overabundance of distances, meaning having observed 30 satellites to get one position, and then to estimate the accuracy of the result of the resulting position. And do they do all of this within a coordinate system. That means that at one point in time or another transformations come into play. Yeah, good, very good points there, Harold. Mathematics is fundamental to all of this. And therefore it has implications for what we need to teach at different levels and how we need to teach those concepts. What about geodetic principles? Do you provide those? Yes, I definitely do. Um, I know, for instance, that 
projections have, a lot, there's a lot of information about projections out in the marketplace. There is comprehensive courses, there is books, there is web pages, uh, there is uh, web courses, a dozen or more web courses. However, what they all miss that to, I had to convince myself that I understood the projections in some way or another. And uh, I had to convince myself that I understood them. And those coordinate systems that invariably form the georeference for regional GIS solutions. These projections, for instance, included the polyconic Lambert and the transverse Mercator projections. For this, I coded both the in Python and tested them against solutions provided by the US Bureau of Land Management. They matched perfectly. Following that, I was certain that I could meaningfully, comfortably and simply cover them in the lectures in, some, in such a way that they become fairly easy to digest. So can this be the basis for a hour or two hour course? Definitely, that's what I have. And I think that many in this community listening to this struggle with some of the things that you and I have chatted about today and also in the, especially in the past where, okay, I'm thinking about my USGS days where we had the Snyder map projections book sort of on a big, huge, and the reason why I needed to be a big, huge table is because that Snyder book, the Snyder book is, is palm thick. And it, uh, it was quite a, a large format. It was like a square meter. The point is, instructors, probably all instructors, are pressed for time, as, as you and I know. And they are grappling with, OK, how can I meaningfully teach these concepts that Harold's talking about right now in the limited time that I have, knowing that many of my students are not going to be projecting data per se, they might be in business or in some other field where they, they all they're concerned about is making core pleth maps and mapping competition and, and, and so on. Not that those folks don't need to know this because even for business students, as you and I have talked about in the past, if they're going to do some study on opening of Arctic shipping routes, I want them to know about map projections, right? I want them to, to care and to understand how to change them if needed. But for many, the point I'm making is that many of those folks are going to be using the projection tools somewhat, but not as much as other people. So given all of those needs and diversity of needs and so on, um, how, how, you know, what's your advice and, and are you providing this kind of information uh, to the marketplace so someone can say, oh, I want to use some of the things that Harold developed so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Most definitely, I, I do that. I'm, for instance, lecturing at the University of Washington of Colorado at Denver. I also created an easy to understand basic course of 15 hour long sessions that is available from my company at geocouncil.com forward slash training that covers all that and more. Each one of these inexpensive recordings can be rented at any time, covering an introduction to trigonometry, coordinate systems, transformations, geoids, ellipsoids, projections, public land service system, and GPS. Keep in mind here is to give the operator the opportunity to use the right lingo when communicating with coworkers and clients which increases the person's credibility. Also recently, I published a book with the title Accuracy in Geomatics that is also dedicated to the beginner in GIS and mapping. It presents the principal accuracy concepts at the level that is easily digested by this audience. It is available from Amazon. By the way, this is my second book. The first one was GIS Data Conversion Handbook, published in 1993. This book is still of use today if paper records and maps are involved in creating a GIS database. I remember that book. That was actually before I met you, but I do have your second book, 
And I think it's marvelous and an excellent contribution to the field. You're stressing basic training in the last some moments that we've had together, not necessarily the advanced training. Ex explain that, Harold, if you could. Yes, thank you. That is by intent. Uh, advanced training is important, it has to be said. However, over the years, I found myself in many places around the world where access to information or the internet were weak. And there were, there were language barriers created further difficulties. I naturally slid into the role of early activator of GIS and mapping programs, which included pulling clients up by the conceptual bootstraps. This forced me to put thought into a clear and effective message in various languages about the basic information people need up front. I found myself doing the same at the university with good results. Advanced training is of course important, but it just is not my main focus. Harold, I think you, you exemplify what we are always encouraging people listening to this to do, and that is be a lifelong learner, be always curious and inquisitive. So that being said, and knowing that you're a inquisitive, curious person, what recent developments in geomatics do you find fascinating right now? Well, um, there are a few. Uh, I would mention two, uh, and which are on the way, and both are important. The first one is a new projection, and the other is the increased use of scanner data. Originally, projections were developed by agencies located at sea level, as in the case of cities along seaboards. This created a problem for locales that are at high elevations, such as Denver, where data have to be scaled down to be fitted into GIS databases. This creates a problem for engineers and surveyors. The US government's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, is developing a new projection called the North American Terrestrial Reference Frame 2022, or NATRF 2022. This new solution is of critical importance because it does not require data to be scaled down into GIS databases. Since the projection surface is now held at ground level and not at sea level, which makes a huge difference in Denver, for example. And because of that, it makes GIS much more user-friendly for civil engineering and survey surveying purposes, which should bring GIS more into focus for that demographic. Another development is the gradual integration of various types of data, such as digital elevation models and scanner point clouds. The use of theodolite scans and LIDAR point clouds are becoming important engineering tools together with automated surface generation and detection that simplify creation of engineering data sets. We know that, for instance, the creation of thin models or triangulated irregular network point surfaces are the basis for automated face recognition that the police utilizes. How mm. does this find its way in GIS? Well, you can automatically cut contours from these surfaces. So it is of interest to bring all of this to the foreground, with, which then because of that will increase the use of GIS by engineers. Fascinating. Thanks, Harold. We're drawing near to the end of our time together and I wanted to make sure that I asked you, given your experience and wisdom on all this. What do you think is the most important thing that we need to work on as the geo education, science, geospatial community? I would say is that the universities need to bring practical geomatics in the con into the context of a balanced education in various fields, including civil engineering. And this only can be done if the tools are more directly 
used by such groups. At the same time, GS software would benefit from further simplification. In addition to more transparent integration of regional data sets, together with the necessary graphic indexing, will make GIS a much more widely used community tool. You and I are passionate about several common things. One of the things that I think we share is we're, we want people to understand GIS in a deeper way. You know, the whole platform notion, data, analytics, communication, tools, etc. But then there's also this wider notion of GIS in academia and in greater society. And sure, we have had advancements in the ease of use, as you and I have been using this and others listening to this have been using it for decades. It's certainly easier to use now than ever before. And that is in part was is what's spurring people like civil engineers, business people, data science, history, digital humanities, and other people, professors, students, and also in, in academia and also in greater society using these tools. So I'm right with you on that. It's it's a really exciting time. And you know, it touches on what you were saying before, Harold, about the need for getting the the community of users greater in number, but also greater in diversity, B backgrounds, the, the experience that people have had from a variety of wide variety of fields to be able to grapple with and solve these perplexing, complex 21st century issues that we're all dealing with. So appreciate your wor words of wisdom on that. What's your advice to new professionals in the GIS fields? Yes, stressing on the word new. I would say that geodetic know-how does escape most novices and there's much to learn. Given that there are many websites that present one topic or another, it is difficult to build a basic collection of relevant concepts. Beginners should gather basic concepts as quickly as they can because that will allow them to satisfy job requirements much faster and providing a peace of mind that is not available otherwise. Thank you for, for those comments, for all of the things that you shared today, Harold, and also just for being a constant reminder for people that, hey, these core concepts, especially the geodetic ones and the civil engineering links and the mathematics and all of the rest of the things that you shared actually do matter. They influence the decisions that you make with geospatial technology because they're fundamental to those decisions. So appreciate those elements and also the links that you're sharing with the users that are accompanying this podcast, especially Harold for your continued leadership in the field. Thank you, Joseph, for your kind time and for inviting me to be part of your platform. I hope to have provided some ideas to your audience and I wish implementation success to all. I hope that everyone will forgive my little plug, but it is something I really feel strongly about.